Chapter 14 deals with the somatic nervous system. What we're going to be looking at is breaking it down into three components, the sensory perception, the central processing then of that sensory information, and then the type of response, which would be the motor response to it. So with sensory perception, we're talking about a stimulus that activates a receptor cell. It's very specific. So if the receptor detects cold temperature, it will not detect hot temperature. Uh, if it detects very light touch, it doesn't detect uh, deeper vibrations or deeper pain. So they're, they're very specific in what they can detect. The receptors can be classified by their structure, by their function, or by their location. Because, you know, we like to have different ways of classifying. If we classify them according to structure, and we're talking about the receptors here, something that's going to be receiving that initial stimulus, there's three main types. There's free nerve endings. Examples of these would be receptors that detect pain and temperature that are found in the dermal layer of the skin. There can be the encapsulated ending. These, an example would be the laminate corpuscles, also found in the, the dermal layer of the skin, that detect pressure and touch. And then you can have some very specialized receptor cells. An example would be the photoreceptors found in the eye. And in this uh, picture, it does show the uh, examples of these three types. So here where you have the free nerve endings over here, the encapsulated nerve endings, and then this is showing uh, one of the types of receptors that's found in the eye that can detect black and white, basically. As I said, you can also classify according to location. Exterior receptors are those typically located very near the stimulus and, and it's picking up the external environment. So a lot of these are located in the skin. Interoceptors are those that receive a stimulus from your internal organs, your internal tissues. And then a proprioceptor is near a moving body part and it helps to interpret movements or positions of the tissues. Oftentimes they're found, say, in your joints. If you look at the functional classification of the receptors, you're looking at things like chemoreceptors that interpret a chemical stimulus, osmoreceptors that respond to changing concentrations of solutes. That's what's dissolved in the liquid portion of the body fluids. So it might be detecting uh, changes in sodium concentration. Nociceptors interpret pain. Mechanoreceptors respond to a physical stimulus like stretching. And then thermoreceptors to, do respond to a change in temperature. We're going to be looking at several of the senses. Now, we usually divide these into general senses versus special senses. The general senses are distributed throughout the body, things like touch. The special senses, there's five main special senses, and they have a, a specific dedicated organ where those receptors are going to be found. So the five special senses are vision, hearing, equilibrium, taste, and smell. So this is going to be involving the eye, the ear, the tongue, and the nose. So we're going to start with gustation, which is the scientific term for taste. There's five different tastes sweet, salty, sour, bitter, and umami. The taste buds are containing the gustatory receptors. Now the taste buds tend to be located beneath the surface. There are these little indentations on the tongue, the side of the mouth. But the taste buds are down in those indentations. So the only way you can taste something is actually it must be in liquid form. It must be dissolved in your saliva for you to taste it. A real quick way if you want to kind of test that out is if you were to take uh, like a solid sugar cube and place that in your mouth, you're not going to taste the sweetness as soon as if, say, you had sugar water, like a soda that's got a lot of sugar in it. 
So if something's in liquid form, you're going to pick up the taste faster than it is in the solid form. Because when you are eating something that's solid, you've got to chew it. It mixes with the saliva. It gets dissolved in that. And then you're able to taste it. Another thing I'm just going to tell you, kind of for your own information, yes, one of the tastes is bitter. Bitter tends to trigger a gag reflux in a lot of people. And a lot of the taste buds that specifically detect bitter are towards the back of the tongue, which really tends to trigger that gag reflux. And there's a survival mechanism associated with this because a lot of your natural poisons have a bitter taste to it. So that's a protective survival mechanism that uh, you don't want to consume something that's a poison. You want to spit it out. So foods that do have a bitter taste, oftentimes in the, the preparation process, we naturally tend to sweeten it up to make it easier to taste. Uh, a lot of coffee has a bitter taste to it, and so that's why a lot of people add sugar or cream or something to, to try to alleviate it a little bit. Another thing, just so you know, 80% of taste is smell because the nerves uh, for taste and the nerves for smell do follow along the same pathways. And so they are directly connected with each other. You all have experienced this. If you have a cold and you're congested and so you can't smell anymore because your nose is all plugged up, Food doesn't seem to taste the same. You're preparing it the same way, but what's happening is you can't smell it. So to you, it's like, well, this just doesn't taste the same. It's that association between them. The other thing is, I would challenge you. Could you describe to someone what a particular food tastes like? Now here in East Texas, a lot of people like their barbecue. Could you describe to someone who's never had, let's say, barbecued pulled pork, can you describe what that tastes like to someone without thinking of the smell? And you probably cannot do it because the two are so intertwined. This is showing over here the... Um, on the tongue where you have got your your taste buds they're for the different tastes they are located in different areas of the tongue so there's different types of these taste buds but the bottom line is look over here you can see that the the taste buds as i was saying they're down beneath the surface they're not right on the surface of the tongue And I will say to the tongue, the cells on the tongue do regenerate fairly quickly, and everybody's aware of that also because um, a lot of us are very impatient when we're hungry. And for some reason, it always seems like with pizza that you're a little impatient and you're so hungry, and you know you just took that pizza out of the oven. You know that it's hot. But what do we still do? We take a nice big old bite of it and, oh, that nice gooey cheese. That is so hot. It burns. And you end up burning some of the cells on the surface. But they re do regenerate. They're epithelial cells. They regenerate very quickly. So within a few days, yes, your tongue initially was sore because you burnt it on the hot cheese. But in a few days, it's back to normal. And we're creatures of habit and never seem to learn because, say, a few weeks later when you're hungry and you have another pizza, we do the exact same thing again. Olfaction is smell. It is a response to a chemical stimulus. The olfactory receptors are in the superior nasal cavity, so up at the top of the nasal cavity. Nerves are going to pass through the lumbic system, so that's why you have an emotional connotation with smell. Maybe good, maybe bad, but you, you tend to have some emotional association with various smells. When you sniff, that's increasing the amount of air into the nasal cavity, allowing it to swirl around more in that upper nasal cavity where the receptors are, so you have a better chance of stimulating them. 
And so this, I thought was a really cool picture that I found of the nasal cavity showing that yes, it's up in the upper or the superior portion of the nasal cavity where those receptors are. And those receptors then um, are attached, they'll stimulate the olfactory bulb and send the process or start the process of sending it to the appropriate area of the brain. And this is just another uh, picture of the same thing showing the nasal cavity. And you notice here in the upper nasal cavity you have these ridges. The purpose of those is to help swirl the air. So when you take in a big breath, you're sniffing something. So you, you take in a big gulp of air, it's going to swirl around in the nasal cavity. That increases, as I said, the chance of stimulating these nerve endings, which are the re olfactory receptors. It's also, in terms of breathing, going to help uh, moisten the air, adds humidity to it, uh, and it also warms it before it goes down into the lungs. And then here's the olfactory bulb right there. Just a little different perspective. Audition, which is hearing, this is going to involve the ear. The ear is divided into three sections. We have the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. Now the purpose of the external ear is to direct the sound waves into that auditory canal or the ear canal. The middle ear is supposed to amplify those sound waves, and then the inner ear converts the sound waves into that neural stimulus. That's where the receptors are going to be, is in the inner ear. The eustachian tube, which a lot of you, most of you hopefully have heard of, and some of you may have unfortunately had some experience with it, that connects to the middle ear. Basically, it's a tube connecting the middle ear to the pharynx. It's supposed to help equalize uh, the pressure. So if we look at the ear, the external ear is what you see outside of the body. This portion is known as the auricle. It's also known as the penna, so you can use either term. And then your auditory canal, your ear canal, which, by the way, you are not supposed to be sticking anything in there. Uh, there are cells that will produce wax to help clean out in the, it's supposed to naturally flow out. Some people better than others, but you are not supposed to be sticking things in the ear canal. The external ear extends, so from what you see outside of the body, all the way to the tympanic membrane. Tympanic membrane, that's your eardrum. So all this is the external ear. Now the middle ear extends from the tympanic membrane over here to the oval window. And it includes your three auditory ossicles, which are the three bones. And as you can see down here is the eustachian tube, which connects to the middle ear. One thing real quick I'll say about the eustachian tube is that in adults, the angle of it is uh, sharper. As you can see, like this would be an adult directly down. In a young child who's still growing, it's more at an angle. So it comes more like this. Part of the reason that we say for young children, say, who are still drinking from a bottle or even from a sippy cup, don't have the child lying down because when they lie down, it's easier for that fluid. This is supposed to be air, but it's easier for that fluid as they're drinking because of the angle to go back up into the middle ear. You don't want fluid in the middle ear. You get apple juice in here, or you get milk in here, you get that fluid up in here. It's a nice warm environment, you now have fluid in here, and you really increase the chances for a middle ear infection. So uh, normally, this is somewhat close, but whenever you swallow, when you hear that, that popping noise, it's basically equalizing the pressure here. When you have a, a ear infection and there's fluid in here, it tends to push out on the tympanic membrane and we can actually see that. Now if this should rupture, and sometimes it does, I actually have a child that had rupture, um, it will repair itself. There may be scar tissue left on there, but it, it will repair. But the middle ear goes from that tympanic membrane over here to the oval window. And like I said, it contains these three bones. 
and here's your station tube. <coughs> Excuse me. The inner ear extends from the other side of the oval window. It contains the semicircular canals. It contains the cochlea, which also has a connection right here to the round window. And then back here, we've got our vestibular nerve and our cochlear nerve. So that external ear, like I said, contains the auricle or the pinnacle, that large outer portion. It is cartilage because it's cartilage. Remember, it doesn't have um, a good vascular supply to it. It's dependent on diffusion. Um, and so it's you cut it. It's not the skin above it's going to bleed, but not the cartilage underneath. And because it's cartilage, that's why you can bend it, etc. So the purpose of that is to help collect the sound waves. And with the auditory canal, it's going to be directing those sound waves in towards the middle ear. The tympanic membrane, that eardrum, it vibrates as the sound waves hit it. The middle ear starts in with that the other side of the tympanic membrane. And as you saw, you've got the auditory ossicles, the malice, the incus, and the states. They will amplify those sound waves. So the tympanic membrane vibrates. It gets those three auditory ossicles moving, and that's going to amplify the sound waves. The stapes is connected to the oval window, and it will get the oval window now vibrating. As I said, it should be filled with air, not fluid, and it has that opening. They keep changing the name. The station tube is what your book calls it. Other books will call it the uh, auditory tubes. A lot of books will call it the pharyngeal uh, tube. So just know, I think probably the most common one is the station tube. But it may have, have other um, names associated with it. So once again, this is just showing. Another depiction of here's your tympanic membrane. Uh, when someone has tubes put in their ears, if someone's had a lot of problems with the ear infections and there's problems with the fluid draining, they put it through the tympanic membrane right here, through that eardrum. So here, this is kind of nice because it's color coded. This lighter color portion right here is the middle ear portion. And now we're going to be moving to the inner ear, but this uh, one right here is a good picture showing the three bones, the malus, the incus, and the stapes. The inner ear is sometimes known as the bony labyrinth because it has uh, a series of canals, but it's embedded in the temporal bone, so it's canals in a bone. It's composed of the cochlea and the vestibule. The cochlea contains the receptors for hearing, specifically their hair cells. They are found in the organs of corti. And then the vestibule, which is going to contain the receptors for equilibrium. The cochlea is attached to the stapes through the, the oval window. As we saw previously, so once again in this picture, here is the stapes. It's attached to the oval window, and on the other side, you have got the cochlea attached right here. So this is the cochlea. It looks kind of like a snail's shell. It has those spirals. That's where the internal in here is where the receptors are for hearing. And then here's the vestibule, which has receptors for equilibrium. And here are your semicircular canals, which are also associated with um, equilibrium. But all this light colored, blue colored, this is the inner ear. So what happens with sound is that whatever is making the sound, showing here a tuning fork, but, you know, listening to music, someone talking, whatever, right now when you're listening to me, those sound waves, they come in, as we said, the external ear helps to direct it into the ear because the receptors are over here. You've got to get these sound waves over here. And you have to convert it from sound waves to that, that neural stimulation, actual potential, etc. So the sound waves come in, 
when they hit that tympanic membrane right here, it starts to vibrate. It moves and gets the three auditory ossicles vibrating. So that's going to amplify the sound now. Once over here on the oval window that stapes, it's moving. So it gets that oval window moving. Now what happens here? So this is where it's attached to the oval window on the upper portion. Here you're looking at just a section of the cochlea. The cochlea, like I said, it looks kind of like a, the spiral here looks like a shell on a snail. This has different chambers in it and they're filled with fluid. So the oval window, it's moving. It gets this fluid moving as it moves down what's known as the scala vestibule. And then when it reaches, so it's going to move down like this. Go around, spiral around this, the shell until it gets to the very middle part. Then it's going, at the very end, it's kind of like a U-turn in there, and it's going to, oh, here we go around. Now on the way back, it's called the scale of tympanum. And so there's vibrations in that fluid. It's now coming back around. And when it comes back around, it'll finally hit the round window. But while it's moving, those vibrations are moving through that uh, fluid that's in the cochlea. There's different areas where it's going to uh, stimulate what's known as the basilar membrane. And that's connected to the organ of corti, which has the hair cells in them that are the receptors for hearing. So this is another uh, depiction of it. So you've got your eardrum, here it goes, vibrating the bones, which vibrates the oval window. Here we go, down around. When it reaches the end, we're in the cochlea now. It's now going to move around, come out, and vibrate at the round window. The round window is going to be moving in response to this vibration. And then between these, these two layers here, these two openings or canals, this internal canal here, that has the organ of corti in it. That's where the hair cells are. So as these vibrations pass over, it's, it's triggering movement of those hair cells. And that's what's stimulating um, and causing those receptors to be activated so that you hear sound. So the sound wave funnels into the auditory canal. Amplification occurs in the middle ear. The vibration of the stapes, that last of the three auditory ossicles in the middle ear, causes vibration of the oval window. That vibration causes that disruption or that movement of the fluid in the scalia vestibule and the cochlea. The fluid vibration then causes disruption of the fluid as it goes around the end of the cochlea internally does a little U-turn. Now it causes disruption of the fluid in the scalia tympanum, still in the cochlea. The membrane of that round window is going to move in response to that fluid movement. As that fluid is moving in the cochlea, it's going to trigger movement of the basilar membrane, which is attached to the organ of uh, corti, which has those hair receptor cells. So here's where your fluid is moving. First through here, then it rounds a corner, it's moving back out through here. Right here is that basilar membrane. And the cochlear duct, this is a third opening, if you will, that has now the basilar membrane right here. Here's the, uh, the organ of corti, has the hair cells on it. That's going to stimulate those hair cells and generate an action potential and boom send it down along the cochlear branch of, um, remember that's one of your cranial nerves, the vestibular cochlear, the vestibular uh, nerve and cochlear one will merge together and then that is sent uh, to the, the auditory section which typically is located, most of it is in the temporal lobe of your cerebrum. Now, equilibrium is another one of your special senses. Uh, the receptors are also found in the ear, specifically also in the inner ear, but in the vestibule. 
For equilibrium, it helps you to sense what your head position is, if there's any movement of the head, and also where the body is relative in motion. Is it still? Is it moving? Etc. For detecting the position of your head, it is going to involve uh, components of the vestibule, the sacral and urethral. The head movement is involved with the semicircular canals. There's three different ones of those. So this here's your cochlea that we saw for hearing. And so the vestibule right here is for the equilibrium. You see these two inner components. And then your three semicircular canals. So for your head position, <coughs> excuse me, um, that's going to be with the vestibule as to whether your head is upright, is your head tilted, and it has to do um, with both, as I said, the macula and the uricle as far as there's little calcium deposits and the position of those with the hair cells. Are they being moved or not? And then the head movement, whether you're rotating or not, that has to do with the semicircular canals. Somatic okay. sensation or touch, this is one of your general senses, so the uh, various receptors are going to be located throughout the body. This picks up things such as pressure, vibration, whether you have an itch, whether it's pain, whether it's light touch, whether it's temperature. And they're very specific whether for all of these, um, cold temperature, hot temperature, etc. And this table just shows some of the different types of the names of, they're usually the counter-receptors that are picking up these touch, various touch sensations, where they're located, what stimulates them. Vision. <coughs> Excuse me. The receptors are located in the back of the eye, in the retina. Uh, for vision, it's going to involve your eye. We also look at your eye muscles, and we also look at some of your eye accessory structures that are there to help protect the eye, such as your eyelids, your eyelashes, the lacrimal apparatus, which is the gland that produces uh, tears. Tears uh, help keep your eye lubricated, keep it moist. Tears also have certain chemicals in them that are very protective. Um, they will kill microorganisms. So it prevents the entry of microorganisms through the eye. So when you look at uh, this diagram, side view of the eye, you can see that most of the eye is actually within that orbital, within that space that's protected by bone. You've got a lot of fat around it. All of this is to protect the eye. You are only actually seeing a small portion of the eye. Your eyebrow and your eyelashes, um, they're supposed to help keep debris and things out of the eye. Sometimes I think your eyelashes cause more aggravation than protection, but that's what they're there for. Your eyelid, as everyone knows, your upper lid and lower lid, they're going to close whenever anything comes close to the eye, once again as a protective mechanism. Uh, the lacrimal apparatus, like I said, that is for producing tears to help lubricate. Every time you blink, it does provide that fluid over the eyes. And then here you can also see a lot of the uh, muscles, the external muscles uh, that are helping to move the eye. And this view right here, this is your optic nerve. So that's the nerve that's leaving from the back of the eye. <coughs> Excuse me. With your eye muscles, there are actually six of them. They, uh, you can see them here and also from this view. The eye muscles are helping to move the eye uh, sideways, up and down, kind of a little bit at angles, etc. Um, some people will have some issues where maybe on one side the muscle is weaker than on the other side and what happens then is the eye tends to drift off center um, one direction or the other they can tell by which way it's pointing which muscle is the weaker one they will usually try initially to uh, 
do exercises to try to help strengthen the, the weaker muscle. Uh, sometimes they will put a patch over the good eye to force the weaker eye to move more and try to strengthen that muscle. If that does not work, they can always do surgery. Uh, it's re usually referred to as lazy eye. And they, they can do surgery to correct that. Uh, they can do it at a very young age, detected early. Um, it's a fairly routine surgery. I mean, any surgery has risk associated with it, but it is uh, a fairly routine surgery. Um, I can speak from experience. When I was about a year old, uh, my parents did have that surgery done on me because I had a lazy eye. Those people who know me now um, have no idea. My family is the only one that knows that I had the surgery. Um, because you, you really can't tell. The only person that could ever tell that I had the surgery was when I was growing up was my mother, who claimed that when I got really tired, because I was initially supposed to have surgery on both eyes, but they only did surgery on one because I was so young. You, you can't really explain to a one-year-old you're going to wake up with both eyes covered. So the plan was to do one eye at a time. So they did the one eye when I was a year old. Um, I've never had surgery done on the second eye because we moved around a lot, so it was never done. So my mother was the only one that could tell if I get really tired. Um, I could never lie to her that I wasn't tired because she'd always tell me to look her straight in the eye, and she could tell the eye that did not have the surgery would start to drift off. <coughs> Uh, but I, I do wear glasses, well, that could be from something else, but uh, whenever I go to a new eye doctor, they pretty much now say they can't even see the scar tissue from the surgery, you know, that um, there's no residual side effects, if you will. So there, there is that surgery that can be done to correct. In terms of the layers of the eye, there's three layers. There's the fibrous tunic. This includes the sclera and the cornea. The sclera is the white portion of the eye. It does cover most of the eye. This is the outermost layer. The cornea is the transparent portion in the front of the eye. This allows the light to pass through. The vascular tunic is the middle layer. It is divided into different sections. The choroid is the majority of it, and this is what's supplying the blood to the eye, to all the, the various tissues of the eye. The ciliary body is uh, more the front of the eye. It's basically an apparatus, contains some muscles that are attached to the lens, and they can adjust, contract, etc. It allows the lens to change its shape. The lens needs to change its shape to focus what you're looking at on the back of the eye. And depending on whether the object is close or far away, the lens has to adjust itself. So the ciliary body contains those muscles that attach to the lens so it can change shape so you can see clearly. And then it also includes the iris. The iris is a smooth muscle. It's going to regulate the amount of light entering the eye. How? Because it's circular muscle in the middle of it is an opening. That's the pupil. That's the black of your eye. That's where the, the light is entering. So the iris, that smooth muscle, this color, the color of it is determined genetically. Uh, so when someone says you have blue eyes, that blue, that's the iris. Or brown eyes, that's the iris. Just FYI, the color can change in the first couple months after birth, and so they will not put eye color on a birth certificate. Usually whatever color the eyes are, usually by six months, that's the color they're going to be. But that is also determined genetically. The, so the iris, the, the pupil, the light is coming in through that, so in front of the pupil is the cornea. And then the innermost layer is the neural tunic, which is also known as the retina, and that's where your photoreceptors are. So in this drawing of the eye, I know it looks rather busy. Obviously, here's the front of the eye. 
So right up here is going to be the cornea. So it's transparent so light can come through here, pass through the pupil, through the lens, and be projected on the retina, the back of the eye. <coughs> Excuse me. So here you're going to have your iris, that smooth muscle in the middle, that opening is going to be the pupil. Right behind it is the lens. And I said this is what has to adjust um, the shape to put the image on the back of the eye. This should be relatively clear. If it becomes very cloudy, that's what cataracts are. And then you have to replace this because the light has to pass through it. So if it's cloudy, you're not going to have um, nice clear vision with it. Here's part of the ciliary body that's holding it, those muscles holding the lens in place and adjusting to the shape of it. And then here you can see the different layers. So the cornea is in the front, but most of that outermost layer is going to be the sclera, and then you've got the choroid layer providing the blood supply, and then the retina. The retina, as I said, contains the uh, photoreceptors. You can see right here is the optic nerve and some of the muscles as well. Now the eye has two basic cavities. The anterior cavity, as the name implies, is in the front. It's between the cornea and the lens. It's filled with aqueous humor that is recycled. The posterior cavity, as the name implies, is in the back of the eye. So it's behind the lens all the way to the, the back. It's filled with vitreous humor. This is not replaced. This is something that they will often, especially as you get older, if you have certain medical conditions such as diabetes, they can measure the pressure of the vitreous humor <coughs> uh, because certain disorders and diseases can affect that. And so in this picture, it's just showing the uh, aqueous humor that's found in that anterior cavity, and then the posterior cavity back here behind the lens is filled with the vitreous humor. The retina, as I said, contains the photoreceptors. There's two types. There's rods and cones. The rods allow you to see in black and white. They also are much more sensitive and very dim light, which is why when it's dark, uh, it's easier to see those black and white features than you can in, in color. The cones allow you to see in color. There's actually three different types of, of cones. Um, they are more sensitive and nice bright light. In the retina, there is also bipolar cells. Ganglion cells is another layer of cells. <clears throat> and in a moment, I'll show you the orientation of them. The axons from the ganglion cells, they're all going to converge in one spot. It's called the optic disc, and then it leaves the eye as the optic nerve. In that optic disc area where all those axons from the ganglion cells are converging, there are no photoreceptors. It's just those axons. So that's actually a blind spot. Why? Because there's no photoreceptors there. And the fovea is the exact center of the retina. And in this drawing, <coughs> excuse me. So way up here, you can see right here is where the optic nerve leaves. So that's where those all the axons come around, and they all congregate here, converge. This would be the optic disc. So there's no receptors there, and it leaves as the optic nerve. If you were to take a point here and go directly back center, that's the fovea. Now, when you look at the retina, down here at the bottom would be the internal part of the eye. Up here, these cells would be right up against the choroid layer, the middle layer. But this is the retina. So the light is going to come into the eye. It's going to pass through these cells here. These right here are the photoreceptors. These are your rods and your cones. So you've got your rods, you've got your cones. Rods, remember, black and white, cones, see color. So the light comes back through here. It stimulates these photoreceptors, rods and cones, 
which then stimulate the bipolar cells, which then stimulate the ganglion cells. And where do all the axons of these go? They all converge here and leave us the optic nerve. And this is just showing here, it's a phobia. Here's where all of the axons, because you've got all of these receptors throughout the back along the retina here. Well, all those axons are going to gather here. So right here, you don't have any receptors. And then it leaves, once again, as the optic nerve. Sensory nerves. As we look at this whole process with the somatic nervous system is you have all these various receptors that have been stimulated. Maybe it's by light with your vision receptors, sound from your auditory receptors, whatever receptors they are, touch, etc. They have been stimulated by something. You have a stimulus, so they become activated. They in turn are going to stimulate your sensory nerves. Your sensory nerves are going to send that impulse to the spinal cord and to the brain. And these will be the spinal nerves and the cranial nerves that we've talked about in previous chapters. Once that information arrives in the spinal cord and then up to the brain, now you have the step of central processing. So uh, the sensory information is going to travel from throughout the body, other than the brain. There's a few nerves in the brain that won't do this, but most sensory information is going to travel up the spinal cord or go through the brain stem, and it's going to go through the thalamus. Remember, the thalamus acts as a relay station. So it's going to take this information and send it to the appropriate region of the cerebrum for analysis. Uh, auditory information tends to go to the temporal lobe. Vision often goes to the occipital lobe. So it's going to send it to the appropriate region. If it's coming up from the spinal cord just before it reaches the medulla oblongata, the axons of the spinal cord, uh, spinal cord are actually going to cross over from one side to the other. So that the left side of the body is controlled by the right side of the brain, and the right side of the body is controlled by the left side of the brain. Now, one thing kind of special with vision that I want to point out to you, <coughs> just so that you are aware. <coughs> excuse me. So you are looking at an inferior view here. So this is the right eye, this is the left eye. Your eyes, when you are looking at something, your field of view here. There is some overlap from the right side and the left side. When the, what you're seeing, it stimulates those rods and cones. The ganglion axons have been stimulated. And those axons leave us the optic nerve. So you've got optic nerve from the left eye and from the right eye. Now the reason it's color-coded here is look what happens at the optic chiasm. Half of the information from the right eye stays on the right side, but half goes over to the left side. And same thing happens with the left eye. So there's this overlap that occurs. Now they're both going to end up back here uh, in the cortex area for vision, for analysis. And then the brain, actually what you see, because light goes through lenses, um, it flips it upside down and reverses it, but the brain back here in the visual cortex area knows to reverse it and flip it back right up again. But for most people what you do is you're taking that field of view from the right side and the field of view from the left side and you have that overlap and that um, usually you're not quite at the same distance for each eye so you're able to overlap and that's what gives you depth perception. Now, some people have some interesting um, disorders with the eyes. Um, another eye disorder that I personally have is that I can see out of both eyes, but never at the same time. My eyes never learn to work together. Whether it's related to the fact that I had lazy eyes as an infant, who knows? There's no way of fully knowing that. So at any one time, I'm only looking out of one eye. I'm either looking out of the right eye or the left eye. Now, I constantly switch back and forth. 
Now I, I can consciously control it if I want to, but usually I don't. I, I have too many other things to worry about than try, okay, which eye should I be looking at right now? I say, if I want to, I can consciously control it, but usually it's, it's a subconscious thing that it's flipping back and forth. But think about it for a second. If I only see, say, out of the right eye, I'm missing part of what most people are seeing. I, I don't have this whole field of view here. And I don't have depth perception because I can't overlay one picture over the other one. And so um, is it a, a disability? No, I don't consider it one. It's the only thing I've ever known. So for me, this is my normal. Um, usually I get asked, oh my goodness, how do you drive? Well, for me, it's an advantage in a way that everything looks closer to me than it actually is. Like I said, I don't really have depth perception. I've, over the years, obviously just kind of learned how, my way to figure out how do I know if something's in front of something else. Well, you kind of look at shadows to figure out what's closest to you versus far away. Um, everything does look closer to me than what it actually is. So if I ever pull up behind you at a red light, don't worry. I'm not going to hit you because I'm probably going to leave six to eight feet between the cars which drives my sister nuts, but um, it, it just, for me, it, this is just the way it is. Now, do not ask me ever to parallel park. I will park four blocks away and walk rather than parallel park because it is hard for me to judge the distance, say, if I'm driving my front right bumper, it's hard for me to judge distance there if something's close to it. Um, but you may end up, you know, who knows where you're going to end up working, in what field. You may end up with some people that may have, you know, different disabilities, including some visual uh, disorders. So you've got the sensory response. You've got the uh, processing of that information so that sensory information was sent to the central nervous system, it got analyzed, sent to the appropriate information. Now, it has to determine if there's a response. So after it's analyzed by the central nervous system, what happens, you're going to incorporate some of the sensory perception into your memory because oftentimes you rely on past experiences to determine the res appropriate response now. So some of that inf sensory perception information kind of goes into your memory banks and you're going to come up with the appropriate response for this situation. Motor uh, controls are mostly going to be controlled by the frontal lobe. And it will send that information down to typically one of the skeletal muscles to respond, contract or relax, depending on what the situation is. Often involved with this will be reflexes. Reflexes typically are a subconscious involuntary response, even though it's involving skeletal muscles, which are voluntary. So some people say, well, how can it be involuntary? It's voluntary muscles. Well, sometimes your muscles move without you thinking about it. For a reflex, what happens is the receptor is going to be stimulated. The sensory neuron then is activated by the receptor. An inner neuron then is activated by that sensory neuron. It can either be in the spine or the, the brain. The motor neuron then is activated by the inner neuron, and you get your response. And like I say, it's going to involve skeletal muscles, which are voluntary, but that response is very quick. Um, and some of them are more complex than others. It may be where uh, you put your hand on a hot burner and the response is, oh, that's hot. Message is sent up to the brain, hot, move the hand, so you move the hand. Some of them are more complex where, say, you're walking and you step on something sharp with your right foot. Now you can be thinking, okay, so the message is sent up. Ooh, that hurts, goes up to the brain that hurts, I need to move my right foot. Well, 
Yes, but it's going to be a little bit more complex than that because if you're, say, walking and you put your right foot down, if you continue to walk, you've taken your weight off your left foot, correct? And if you now move your right foot, you're going to end up on your backside. So at the same time, what you have happens is information goes up pain of right foot move right foot but at the same time you need to put left foot down shift your weight to your left foot so that you don't end up falling and that has to be timed shift the weight to the left foot before you lift up your right foot so some of your reflexes are fairly simple some of them are more complex